We're talking today about watchdogs, and there are quite a lot of them. There's the courts, there's the Ombudsman, there's ICAC, there's the Auditor General, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, parliamentary committees, the Equal Opportunity Tribunal, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, Anti-Discrimination Board, Royal Commissions and Special Commissions, Magisterial Inquiries and Departmental Inquiries. Why do we need them? One would think that you elect your MPs to do all those things. That's their job. Your councillors are supposed to do it. Your ministers are supposed to do it. Your public service is supposed to do it. Your courts are supposed to do it. Your police are supposed to protect your liberties and your safety and engender good community spirit. What the hell's gone wrong if none of these people do their job and you have to have this other layer then of all these watchdogs necessary to tell you or to do for you what the people you elect are not doing for you. I've mentioned all of these watchdogs and I've left out the most important one or, or altogether the most important one and that's you. You, the citizens of Australia, are the most important watchdog of all. I went to Sweden in 89. As far as I'm aware, I was the only politician ever to be awarded a Churchill Fellowship and it caused a lot of debate at the time. And out of that came this Churchill report. As a Churchill Fellow, I could meet with whoever I wanted to at any level in the bureaucracy or in the government. And I learnt a lot. In that report, you will find an extraordinary amount of information. The openness and accountability there was a shining example. In the context of the treatment of Julian Assange, are you surprised with the way Sweden has handled his case? Because I wanted to actually ask you, given all of your research, it occurred to me when I saw that you'd written this and had the and it was Sweden based. The, the approach taken in the Assange case, according to this brief provided by the lawyer, uh, it seems to be contrary to all of the stuff. Yeah, that I, I, well, that's, that's something that, that law has been developed since I've been in Sweden. Jen Robinson highlights just the very shabby approach to investigating this matter, picking it up, investigating it, dropping it, and then revisiting it, shopping around for a jurisdiction picking it back up, there was the appeal process, releasing material to the press the day after he gives his testimony, which is supposed to be private, obviously, given all of their, mm. their, their laws, uh, and it's sort of in the tabloid the next day, not um, wanting to interview him when he went to the UK and offered to go to a Swedish embassy. It was all of that, the process that one would expect Sweden to follow, that kind of just went out the window in this case. And then you've got the reports from this point when you're writing this paper, then you've got the Gothenburg prison that's been heavily criticised, the fact that people can be detained, um, you know, in circumstances which are, you know, unsatisfactory. By our, yeah, no exactly. bail for foreigners. No bail for foreigners. Uh, and, have, in fact, Sweden has been guilty of, you know, rendition of a couple of suspects uh, to Egypt where they were subsequently tortured mm. and criticised mm. for that, which mm. just seems so... Having heard your comments about the Swedish model seems so out of character. I'm very disappointed and possibly a bit shocked because I always regarded as a result of my experience in uh, 89 and discussions with numerous heads of government departments, the Mayor of Stockholm, police commissioners and people of the judiciary, how open that society was, uh, how fair that society was. Uh, how enlightened that society was. There has something happened in Sweden since then which I don't understand. There seems to be a developing restriction on people's rights and what I thought was in Sweden's enlightened approach of a fair go. The lesson for Sweden, however, is that the world is watching you. And what do you think our government should be doing? comes down to leadership. First of all, as Malcolm Fraser said in his oration a few days ago, we have to stand up for what is Australian, 
for what are Australian values, for who are Australian citizens. We have to take due cognizance of the opinions of our allies and allegiances and alliances. But the only way we will get respect on the international stage is to be and seem to be Australian, sticking to Australian values, protecting the rights of Australian citizens and letting people know in no uncertain terms that that's where we stand. There has not been one statement come out of the government or the opposition in Australia which reflects any of that opinion at all. And in fact, it's not only been kowtowing to the interest of America in particular and possibly other uh, international intelligence agencies, but we have the situation where our Prime Minister is actually branded by comments Assange as a lawbreaker, if not a criminal, when he's been charged with no offence and, in fact, committed no offence under Australian law. So the first thing our Prime Minister ought to be thumping the table with, I'm sorry, but I must say this to our American ally, that this citizen of Australia has broken no Australian law and we, therefore, will uphold his rights to innocence his rights to the presumption of innocence, just as they're attempting to do with the former speaker right now. Oh, yeah, that is how ironic. We just found out from an article last night that Gary Lord put out that most Australian politicians didn't know a thing about it, you know? I think people think that politicians are across the issues in detail. Mm -hmm. And as you say, there are so many issues that politicians have to focus on at any given time. But does it surprise you with a case of, which is of such a high-profile nature that politicians may not yet be across the facts of the Assange yeah, case. Yeah. Let, me, let me detail what's happened uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, but particularly in recent times. Politicians, particularly in marginal seats, become swamped mm. in relatively minor local pastoral issues with their constituents. First thing. Secondly, it doesn't pay to be vocal That's the uh, within the party structure. Yeah. Keep your head down, right? Thirdly, that's not my responsibility. I have a minister or I have a shadow minister whose responsibility that comes on. And therefore, I have, because I don't want to know about it, got the perfect excuse. Not that I have an obligation to protect the rights of the Australian citizen. So there is a, an actual ignorance. There is a studied ignorance. There is a reluctance. There is a discipline. Uh, there is a self-serving attitude. None of which serves the public interest. We're portrayed as being rugged uh, people who are not afraid to stand up for their rights and so on. I don't think in a democracy in a, in a so-called open society like Australia, if you could find a comparable place in the world, that there would be as many timid and frightened people in that nation as there are in Australia. The people I feared most are not the corrupt, they're the weak. The people who would let you down, who would never stand up, who would never support you. And those who used to support me and who showed courage were the, honestly the most unexpected people at times. They had it in their heart and they had the courage of their convictions. That has always been a small minority, no matter in any country, at any stage in history. Mm. And I'm telling you, it's a very small minority in Australia. When you look at this from the point of view of 
your experience with corruption and influence peddling and wheeling and dealing does on the face of it um, it look as though there is political interference do you get that sense when you look at the Assange case I really don't know there's no doubt that there's a climate of international pressure uh, and mutual interest who in any country, democratic or undemocratic, wants a WikiLeak operation to go unchallenged? They all have dirty secrets to protect, reputations to protect, uh, dirty deals to protect. So it's in their mutual interest that if you come across somebody who's doing it, you make an example of them whether it's just or it isn't just. That's common sense. That's the only answer I can give you. Do you think that Assange is in a better position as a journalist or a senator in terms of receiving information as a journalist with his anonymous dropbox or as a senator with that privilege? Senator. Definitely as a senator. Why is that? Well, first of all, he's got the privilege of the parliament. He's got an, a, a ready-made audience. Uh, he cannot be sued for defamation, provided he acts very carefully. He simply needs to read the stuff into Hansard, right? And it is there for all to see. As a senator, he has a public standing because he's been elected, therefore a public support base which is identifiable and therefore a profile which can be internationally supported. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a senator in the Australian Parliament who is saying this.